then we can we'll let you know how to get in contact with us. So if you have any particular questions, you can comment right on the video on YouTube. We'll be checking that as well as Twitter. We'll be checking at Swag Test Prep. So first follow us, then ask your question, and we'll be able to answer that um, while we're going through our own. Or Facebook message us. Yeah, face that that works too. All right. So if you're on, if you're watching this on YouTube right now, just subscribe to our channel so you will get updates in the future as to when we are doing this. All right, Josh. Without further ado, further ado, let's start off with um, imperialist I, Durings and Venezuelan squall. Yeah. So All in right. case anyone's wondering, we're just working our way down the packet that we got in class, um, expanding on each question, um, and then doing the identifications and um, talking about that. All right, so basically, um, peerless during in the late 1890s, or throughout the whole 1890s, there were a bunch of books published about um, imperialists. Uh, one of them was Alfred Thayer Mahan, who advocated that control of the sea meant world dominance, that uh, encouraged people to spread our navy, spread imperialism. Um... Another guy was Reverend Josiah Strong, who advocated for a manifest destiny, so to speak, uh, beyond our borders across uh, saying it was our divine duty, God-given duty to yeah. American yeah. power. Josiah Strong wrote uh, Our Country. That's yeah. important to know. And the Venezuelan squall was to... Um, and um, those were factors that led America, like Josiah Strong and Alfred Mahan, as well as our economy was growing at a faster rate and we needed more outlets to like spread our labor force, or so we thought. So we required more uh, land and more natural resources. Um, so that really led to America to expand beyond our borders. And if we're following along in the textbook um, there's a cartoon that shows the other European powers such as Russia Germany and Britain taking their land and the argument that many imperialists made is that they're all taking our land and we need to get into action to take our land um, before it's all gone and uh, yep. alright so that was a basic overview and now I'll just expand on each question in particular um, so we can go from there. So what factors cause America to turn its attention to world beyond, behind, beyond her borders? So as we know, this was during the debate uh, between the anti-imperialists and the imperialists. Obviously, the imperialists wanted to expand uh, all across the country because they felt that that would give them power, and the anti-imperialists didn't want to because they felt that it violated the consent of the governed um, which was stated in the Declaration of Independence. So the first question, um, why did they want to be imperial, imperialist? Uh, this was because the population was consistently growing. Uh, there was They had a lot of wealth, so they could spend that. And there was a very high productive capacity, so they felt that this was a time where they could just expand and um, enforce their what they had towards other countries. Then there was also labor violence and agrarian unrest, which also promoted this uh, imperialistic I ideals. Uh, then there was also the yellow press, which becomes a bigger issue later on, but what it was was just newspaper articles that sort of advocated for imperialism, and it swayed the opinion of the public in order to, um, to have the same beliefs. Uh, and also another motive was that they wanted to spread the religion, uh, this Anglo-Saxon idea, to other people because they felt that they were superior and that by doing so they would be helping out um, these lower levels of people. That was a there, part of uh, Josiah Strong's argument in our country. Yep, and then there was also social, social Darwinism, um, which also advocated for this. Um, yeah. So then, the second question was, how does political, how does the po political part cartoon on page six twenty six supplement an American imperialist argument for expansion? 
so I know Mr. Melvin was saying that we might have to do something like this on the test. And if you look at page 626, it's just a bunch of people or representatives from different countries like grabbing at the globe. And what this is showing is that everyone wanted to, um, since ev all major territories and powers were claiming territory, uh, America thought that they had to do so in order to be equals with them, and they didn't want to fall behind on this. So they too decided to um, grab at and pick territory where they could uh, be powers within. All right. Um, so this section also references the Venezuelan squall, and all that that was was a border um, dispute between the country of Venezuela and uh, which was an independent country and the British territory of Guyana. There's this big area where there was a border dispute, and um, they found gold even more complicating this issue. But America, specifically the U.S. Minister to Britain, Richard Olney, sent them a letter and saying, because of the Monroe Doctrine, you're not allowed to be colonizing in our um, hemisphere to give Venezuela back their land. Yep, so oh. if you if you look at page 625, there's a great map that uh, accurately portrays like the British claim, Venezuela claim, and then claim, and then the final line of where it was actually drawn. Um, looking at that map will show you that actually the British gained a lot more land than they should have, even though it was like was like not their right to be invading on this territory. Yeah, and this was during a period of British anger by Americans, and then a little bit later, uh, Britain realized that they needed friends, allies in the world. ...in Cuba, General Weiler, or Whaler, um, was putting all these uh, insurgents or rebels in Cuba into these reconcentration camps, which um, was almost very similar to the Holocaust in that they were torturing uh, the people and putting them in these like really negative situations um, and causing problems for them. So America decided that it was in their best interest to get involved. Uh, then how did yellow journalists play a role in arousing Americans, uh, arousing American antagonism towards the Spanish? Um, so it basically just really like exactly. Um, there's a picture. Let me find what page it was on. Uh, I was on page 629 of our textbook. You can see that there's like bodies flying. Um, there's smoke. Um, it just the scene that it depicts is a lot worse than what actually happened, and that has to do with the exaggeration of yellow journalism um, that was playing with the emotions of. Um, it was Dupu or Dupu or something. It's D U D U P U. No, D U P U Y. So he wrote a message to France, right, um, talking about McKinley and criticizing McKinley. Politics play a role, right? So McKinley feared that if he didn't declare war, then the he would be criticized in the next election for not doing so, and therefore he would he would lose his chance or anyone from his party's chance of being elected uh, the next term. So that's how the party politics played a role. Um, and we have a question or like a. So so far, all that we've talked about is pre-Spanish American War stuff. But now the next session, Dewey's made a victory at Manila and imperialistic plums. Now we're going into um, the Spanish American War era. So you can divide into three arrows this section, Spanish-American War, pre-Spanish-American War, and post-Spanish-American War. We're moving into that second wartime era now. All right, so Dewey's May Day victory. America does go to war with the Spanish, even though it would be over Cuba, that he should go to Manila and attack because Philippines, where Manila is, was also a Spanish possession. So... Dewey does just that on May Day, May 1st, when America de or McKinley declared war against the Spanish. He uh, moved in to the Philippines. Um, he easily captured um, Manila because there was 
no one else there. Because, like, some of the Spanish ships didn't even work. And um, this became an imperialistic plum because now we were kind of on track to take over the Philippines, even though the war was over Cuba, and Hawaii remained another um, uh, pride possession or, pri or uh, desire to get. So that was that section. Um, Rahul, want to go into the questions and identify? All right. So number seven. Right? Why did Commodore Dewey have such an easy victory over the Spanish fleet at the Philippines? So one good reason was that it, there were good leaders, right? There was John D. Long and Theodore Roosevelt, who at the time were very um, sophisticated and very well, like knowledge or well uh, learned in war, and they sort of were good at dealing with situations like this. So a reason why America did so good was that it's not that they were just like really great, it was just that Spain was like really, really bad. So that's why the war went so quickly, and that's also why they felt that they were doing so good. It was not that they were just like really, really superior, it was that um, Spain was just not up to par when it came to like war. It was actually funny because in the Philippines, I think at Manila, one of their ships just did not work and did not move. So they were just sitting there like, oh, okay, we just have to stay here right now, right? So, um, yeah, so it's just that Spain was really bad. Um, and another reason was that they were operating thousands of miles from their home base, so they, they couldn't really transport goods and messages. That communication time span was very, very long and hard to like do as opposed to US they had like Hawaii as like a short, sort of stopping point um, and they could easily work like that um, and it's not to say that US was also bad it, they just were not that great they were they were about average or they were just better than Spain so that's how they ended up winning uh, then also what rationalization was given for the quick annexation of Hawaii uh, so America needed it as a cooling and provisioning station to help assist Dewey, as I me mentioned for the previous question. Um, so having that little stop area allowed them to reload and su resupply and help them um, fight the war all the way in the Philippines so they didn't have to travel all the way back to America. Because the distance, if you look at the map, it, you might think that it's very short, but in theory or in like reality, it's really, really long, and having Hawaii in between was just very beneficial. Uh, then also, uh, so they didn't want to risk neutrality and risk the vengeance of Spain by annexing. Um, yeah, so I guess if we look at the people, or the people that we have to know for this section, right, Teddy Roosevelt, we know that he was the assistant secretary to John D. Long. Um, he was very aggressive. He liked fighting, definitely an imperialist. And he basically ordered Dewey when Long was away to go to war with the Philippines. Um, then on, So then on to George Dewey. George Dewey was the commander of the American Asiatic Squadron at Hong Kong, so he was already stationed there, just waiting for Roosevelt to give his orders. Uh, and he attacked the Philippines, uh, Luzon, then Manila. And there was no loss of life in his fleet, and he almost instantly became a national hero just because of the fact that he was easily able to have a victory. And then there was Emilio Aguinaldo, who's very important because he was a um, he was a Filipino insurgent who was actually exiled from the Philippines by Spain when they came to invade and sent to China. Um, and as he was there, he I mean he was not allowed back into the Philippines. But when America came to attack, they brought. Uh, Aguinaldo from China along with them and he aided uh, them in rebelling and taking back possession of the Philippines. And it's I guess interesting because 
Aguinaldo, after he doesn't realize that America plans to take over the Philippines after they invade, he just thinks that they're trying to help them out and help them regain control of the Philippines. But after America actually does so and actually gets the Spain to leave, Aguinaldo becomes against America because now he's fighting America to get America out of his homeland and his home territory because they sort of assume the same role that same that Spain had um, on the Philippines. So I guess that's a summary of that situation. All right. So another turn to know along <laughs> like with that is jingoism, which is just a concept of extreme um, imperialism. So let's go on to the confused invasion of Cuba, curtains for Spain, duty, destiny, and dollars. All right, so the invasion of Cuba is kind of confused because it was supposed to just be about Cuba, but it ended up being about, like, Philippines somehow, too. And it went fairly well for the Americans. Um, we were able to take Santiago into relatively easy battles, um, one on a San Juan Hill, which was actually Kettle Hill. That was the famous Ross Riders led by um, Teddy Roosevelt. So we were able to take over um, Cuba with um, little difficulty, uh, or some difficulty, but it wasn't really that hard to invade Cuba. And um, a lot of... And then it's basically just a section that goes talks about Cuba, how we took it over, and um, how there were still a lot of issues going on in the Philippines. And before I let Rahul go into more details, we had a question about why did America almost go to war with Chile? Back to the time frame question, this was... Uh, couple of years before the war, and that's because two um, sailors were uh, kidnapped. Two American sailors were kidnapped. They were actually killed. Or killed um, off the coast of Chile, and this led to like an international problem, and then Italy got involved, but the issues were eventually abated off the coast of Chile, so we didn't end up going to war there. But it was one of several instances in the 1890s that almost caused a war. Okay, so now let's focus on the specific questions, number 9 and 10. Uh, so number 9 asks, or says, to describe the fighting in Cuba. So as I already said, Spain was really bad, and America was pretty good. So America had the advantage there. Um, and what happened was that Cervera, um, I, I think there might be a map of how this played out. Uh, let me see. Yeah, so if you go to page 635 in the book, there's a pretty accurate or a correct drawing of how the... Um, how the Cuba war sort of uh, ended up. And if you take a look, you can see that from Tampa, Florida, the American forces sailed over to Santiago, where they set up a naval blockade. Um, and they also sailed in from the other side to sort of like sandwich in um, the Spanish forces. So in that little like inlet, right by Santiago, that's where the Spanish forces were currently stationed. And I guess that was really bad for them because America, by sort of forming the blockade around it, forced them to stay inside. So what they had to do was if they just – they already had this blockade. They would just get on land, come from behind, and now the um, Spanish were completely surrounded. Um, and this proceeded into the Battle of El Cani, which was July 1st, 1898. Uh, Kettle Hill, which was also July 1st, 1898, and San Juan Hill, who was also July 1st, 1898. Uh, Spanish, some Spanish fleets tried to leave that little inlet, but eventually were just completely destroyed by the American 
blockade. Um, all right. So let's see. Question. Is that in? All right. Question. Oh, okay. All right. So let me just go back to nine for a second. So, in terms of casualties for America, the c casualties were not so much from actual war fighting. They were just from the disease and like effects that came afterwards. Um, and so, I guess you could still look at them as casualties of the war, but they were not from actual fighting. Uh, so it was sickness more than bullets. Um, okay, so number 10. What were the various reasons that led McKinley towards holding out for U.S. acquisition of the Philippines? So this was because he thought that people would resort to anarchy um, because he thought they were not capable of governing themselves. Uh, and then he feared that Germany would take over um, and then in turn America would be forced into the war. Um, and that was not something they were looking for. So he realized that by just taking over the Philippines, he would prevent these things from happening. And this sort of leads into, uh, what's the term? I think it was called um, right benevolent assimilation. Right. It was McKinley's attempt to improve the situation in the Philippines in terms of like hygiene, cleanse, cleansiness, um, uh, yeah, so, um, and then he also thought that giving back Philippines would be dishonorable because, like, that's not something you do once you just acquire a territory. Uh, and then also this plays in, what plays in is the white man's burden, right? So that's a big concept that is with this chapter, and this burden was that it was the white man's duty to, like, uh, provide this sense of Christianity and Christian Christianize the areas that they took over because in doing so they would be benefiting the lower people in society because they were so superior. That was just a mentality that they had and um, that's sort of another motive that played a part there. Alright, so before we talk about America's horror slash court Core slash core curse of empire. Uh, let me address the question. Um, in San Juan Hill, was the battle when the Spanish didn't even know how to use machine guns? They were given to them by the Germans, and Germans are trying to teach them how to use them in the middle of battle, which obviously didn't go over well. And just a clarification about the almost war situation in Chile. Um, the reason why it was um, averted because Chile agreed to pay. America an indemnity to cover the damages. So America's curse of empire. <laughs> the reason why he had curse, curse uh, written with curse question mark in the book is because the anti-imperialist league, uh, which featured many prominent Americans, thought it was a curse um, that we shouldn't be doing um, imperialism, and most of these people thought that because of moral reasons we shouldn't um, imperialize other countries, but it happened anyway, and we ended up getting Puerto Rico, Philippines, Guam, and Cuba. Rahul, want to answer question 11? Yep. Okay, so question 11 says, what were the arguments for and against the annexation of the Philippines? So you had the anti-imperialists and the imperialists. Um, and so... Reasons against it were that it would violate the consent of the governed, and this was a philosophy that was present in the Declaration of Independence. And obviously, these people didn't want to look like hypocrites because by violating the consent of the governed, they were just going against what they had advocated for in the Declaration of Independence. Um, and also, they were against it because it would pull the U.S. military into the Far East, and... Um, that was at the time considered to be Japan's, Russia's, at uh, Japan's and Russia's territory. Um, and then they're also against it because the phrase despotism abroad equals despotism at home. And that just means, I mean, despotism, that word just means that like imperialism or like superpower, overbearing power. So they fear that like if they were overbearing abroad or, yeah, abroad, 
they would be overbearing at home, and nobody really wanted that as citizens. So, yeah. So, I mean, the, then it came to why were some people for it? They were for it because they saw that there were multiple opportunities in terms of trade profits um, and ways to make a lot of more money and obviously larger increase in land and they felt that America as this like rich figure should help the poor or the Philippines um, as this poor figure so they thought by taking control they were sort of helping them out um, then there were also like natural resources that were present in the area and the white man's burden how they wanted to sort of um, increase Christianity or influence Christian principles in their way of life. All right, so um, in <laughs> America, the Puerto Ricans, um, real quick, they just had different status than other immigrants because the 1800s, late 1800s, were a period of a lot of immigrants, but um, they were able to find jobs more easily in urban and rural settings because of their statuses, and also very important was that. It was easier for them to go home um, because it was cheaper airfare uh, eventually or boat fare and it was a short commute so that made the Puerto Ricans less isolated from their uh, motherland than other European uh, influences or immigrants. All right, so are we good with number 12? Um, yeah, so. pretty much. I think I covered it. Yeah. So I think I'll go on to 13, our perplexities in Puerto Rico and Cuba, and we're going to start picking up the pace a bit. Yep. Getting a little late. Uh, so let's see that. Perplexities in Puerto Rico and Cuba. So in Puerto Rico, uh, we ended up, we are like, might as well, we're in a war of... Um, Puerto Rico, minus well, get into war with them. Why not take <laughs> or take them over? Uh, that went fairly smooth. Um, and Cuba was an interesting case because of um, the Teller Amendment, which we instituted before the war in our declaration of war, saying that if we won Cuba, we would give it back. Uh, we'd give them back their independence. So that was the perplexity there. So we're we'll want to answer question 13. All right, let's get right into that. Okay, so number 13, describe the American treatment of Cuba after the Spanish-American War. So the Treaty of Paris, right, declared them independent. Uh, and then what happened was General Leonard Wood, he helped fix Cuba economically and in terms of like the disease yellow fever that was currently I want Walter Reed that um helped read the yeah yeah fever. yeah yeah so um so then there was also the Teller amendment of 1898 which um said that the US would withdraw from Cuba which happened in 1902 um and then what it also said was that Cuba would agree to not let anyone else take over, and another part was that they would have to provide Guantanamo or like some naval base, which ended up being Guantanamo, to America. And then there was the Foraker Act of 1917, which uh, said that Puerto Ricos could now also yeah. govern themselves. Um, yeah, so the important people... Let's look at insular cases, right? Hold on. Yeah. Where is it? Okay. So insular cases were seven Supreme Court cases concerning the status of these uh, Spanish-American war gains, um, and they concluded that full constitutional rights would not extend to the territories, and this would mean that they would not enjoy all the rights that American citizens had. Then there was General Leonard Wood, who was a rough rider during the war. He was stationed in Cuba after the war, and he improved their government, finance, education, agriculture, um, and public health. So in terms of public health, 
that brings me to Walter Reed. And Walter Reed conducted research on yellow fever, which was causing a lot of deaths. And he experimented on people and realized that the Stegomia, Stegomia mosquito was a carrier, carrier of yellow fever. And he eventually attacked its starting point and slowly started to end its um, effect. Um, yeah, so then you have the Platt Amendment. So the Platt Amendment said that Cubans had to write into their constitution in 1901 that they would not let anyone or any other power take over them. Um, and the U.S. is basically allowed to intervene or restore, restore order uh, whenever they wanted. So that just means that it's like a free pass to enter whenever they wanted. So they made, she, made sure they still had that connection. And they and um, Cuba would have to provide a naval base. So if you put this into perspective, Cuba was basically saying, okay, America, you can come in whenever you want. And by the way, we're going to give you this naval base that's right next door, so you'll be right next to us. Whenever you want, just enter in, and I guess that's freedom for us. So it was very limited, but they were not a part of America, so I guess you could say they were independent. By the way, they were forced to sign the Platt Amendment, or else they wouldn't have got their independence. Yeah, so it was very but, limited, um, but yeah. All right, I think Gu Guantanamo was just a coaling and naval system for the U.S., um, which was brought upon by the Platt Amendment, and the only way it could be revoked is the consent of both parties, and as we know, Guantanamo Bay is still here today, still being used. All right, next, Josh. All right, so um, New Horizons and um, Two Hemispheres. Uh, so how we're going to do this now is we're going to alternate sections. Now, just makes it go quicker, doing the whole section. So, New Horizons and Two Hemispheres, that was basically after the two, uh, war. We had, like, the Pacific Territory and, um, or, like, Caribbean now. And this led to a false impression on modern warfare, because America thought that all warfare would be relatively easy, <coughs> because this was, it was a splendid little war. So, um... That led to false impression, especially going to World War One, because we expected it to be easy. Yeah. So as I mentioned, it was not that America was like amazing. It was just that Spain was really bad. So that just gave them this like false sense of like superiorness, um, and sort of made them feel that they were really great. Okay. Next, Little Brown Brothers in the Philippines, Josh. All right. So. The Little Brown Brothers is what uh, William Howard Taft, who was the provisional governor of the Philippines, called them. He bonded well with them, and he started something called benevolent, or carried out benevolent assimilation, trying to assimilate them, get them into American culture, like the good way. Um, hence benevolent. And um, the... And in the Philippines, we show the good and bad sides of American imperialism. Good side, because we improved the Philippines. We improved their roads, sanitation, um, health, and school system. But it was bad because we, we kind of commit a lot of atrocities. We tortured the Filipinos and incidents. We spent a lot of money. And the Filipinos thought it was insulting that we spent all this money on improving there because they're like, who is there to say that your school systems are better than the ones that we have now? So it's a good representation of both the book, good and bad sides of American imperialism. So we're we'll want to talk more about the open door in China. Okay. So question number sixteen: Why was American involvement in China beneficial? So unlike Britain's involvement or the other European involvement, America was beneficial to China. Um, because they put a stop to the Boxer Rebellion, and they, after it was over, they gave a share of their money to China, and China would use this money to educate the poor. Um, and so to expand a little bit on the Boxer Rebellion, 
there were people or Chinese people that wanted to kill the foreign devils. They were, that was like their motto. Um, it actually did result in many, many deaths, and they really wanted to spread their message, so they were very aggressive. Uh, and then the open door policy. So this is like a very important idea that we will have to tell you, teach you. Um, so what it was was that um, there were all these like powers or European powers that lined up alongside of China that each would set up like their own um, trading posts and stuff so they'd gain profit off of this. And America showed up and I guess they showed up too late and there was nowhere to take. So what, what Hay decided to do was open the door so everyone could trade in between all these different posts, right? And the only people that were with America was Italy. And Italy it was funny because Italy themselves, they didn't have a post, so obviously they would be totally open to um, this uh, open door policy. Uh, but eventually, when everyone everyone agreed except for Russia, and Russia did not agree because they were building a railroad uh, that connected Russia and China, and uh, they didn't agree. And it was funny because Hay basically just walked in and he said, "Oh, everyone agreed to it," and Russia was like, "Oh, maybe we did agree." So like they didn't really know what they were talking about. And eventually, this open door policy and Hay circular was. Enacted. Hay Circular was in 1900, and it was just the circulation between each like little circle or post along the coast of China. If that made any sense, I don't really know. But if you have any questions, just ask. All right. Um, let me clarify. Hay Circular. Um, it wasn't the circulation. Um, it's basically saying or urging everyone to respect China's um independence. And try not oh, to well, yeah, yeah. Or petition it. All right, so let's talk about the Filipino um, immigrants. They weren't, um, they were not like welcomed with um, open arms in America. America had anti-immigrant feelings. Um, they were forced to hard work, or they could do temporary work, but that that was easier. But had poor job security, so it wasn't easy. <coughs> So we're we'll going to talk about imperialism or Bryanism and the 1900 election. Yeah, yeah, but, but before I do that, uh, I have to give a shout-out to the Dirty Scissors. Um, <laughs> apparently it's a rap group at Randolph High School, and they wrote a flow that they want me to spit out right now. So, <laughs> all right, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Swag test prep on that dirty scissor rhyme. Killing study sessions, you would think it was a crime. Clear rhymes, dope flow, never getting murky. Study that vocab, that's why your verses get chunky. Dirty. <laughs> All right, thanks to that dirty scissors for providing that. I don't know if I did that right. <laughs> All right, so where, where were we? Number 17? Bakers of America, or, yeah, no, 18, okay. I did 17. Oh, okay, 18. Uh, what issues were important in the 1900 election? So basically, 1900 election came down to imperialism, and it came down to the form of currency. So imperialism was the heated debate that has consistently been going on for a while, imperialism or no imperialism, and then currency became a uh, big issue because... There was the gold standard or the silver standard. Um, the gold standard was that the monetary system would be based off of how much gold America had, and this system was used to trade with um, overseas with other countries, right? So say one U.S. dollar were to equal one ounce of gold, and two German currency or whatever they had at the time uh, was also equal to one ounce of gold that would mean that two German dollars or two German currencies was equal to one dollar. So they were able to trade that way, and that sort of made everything um, compatible and easily able to be traded and done. All right. So, yeah, if you have anything to expand on that, then. All right, so let me talk about T.R. Brandisher, the big stick. Um, that was his mantra when it came to 
foreign policy, he said, speak softly and carry the big stick. Big stick is um, having like power at your disposal. In this case, the armed forces, the navy. Um, that's the way to get your way in um, negotiations. So Teddy Roosevelt is an unconventional president. He had a wild lifestyle. He was kind of a renaissance man, jack of all trades. He was like a ranch owner and a cowboy. Um, so he had kind of a very interesting life. And this big stick proverb uh, influenced his foreign policy because he got involved in a lot of world issues and always carrying this big stick, this power, this threat, you can think of it. And another term is the bully pulpit. And he referred to the White House as his bully pulpit. And um, that basically meant that that was an era where he could give a lot of good evidence for um, speeches, um, hear out good arguments from. So that was his uh, policy. He basically believed that it was not his job to listen to what American people want. It was his job to think what he wants and convince the American people that what he wants is what he actually wants. Um, <coughs> this is the opposite of how the Constitution intended for the job of president to go. And, Rahul, do you want to do the building of the canal, or do you want me to handle that? Do, do I need to talk about 19 and 20? Um, I did 19 and 20, or covered upon it in my... Uh, okay. Report. So, yeah, if anybody has any questions about those qu questions specific specifically, just ask us, but you should be fine with what we have so far. All right, you can just go it just... Do you like the brief summary, and then I'll expand on 21 and 22. Just give like a really brief overview. All right, the Panama Canal. All that was happening there. So uh, there were two people wanted. To, all right, so America. Right, so the idea of having a canal across Central America has been prevalent for a while. Um, earlier in the 19th century, America signed the Clayton Burwell's Treaty with Britain saying that they would have to, that they would build any canal together. But then later, um, they signed the hay Ponce Treaty, saying that America has the right to go ahead and build a canal through Central America, but Britain can use it for life for free. Um, and there were two options. There was a Nicaraguan canal through Nicaragua or Panama, which was a territory of Colombia. Uh, originally, it was planning on going through um, Nicaragua, but the owner, Benu Varilla, from the French guy, who started building a canal earlier, which failed um, and still held the rights for the canal, ended up um, selling them for a very cheap price. That's why America ended up building it through um, Panama, and it ended up being an easier route uh, structurally. To build, so um, that was a thing, and then there was a big issue because Colombia didn't want us to build a canal through Panama, but Panama eventually revolted, became an independent country, and shortly afterwards, um, America built a canal. Um, the new Varilla was became the governor of Panama. George Washington Gothel was the guy who built the canal. And um, I and the uprising. Uh, many people think thought that Teddy Roosevelt was directly involved in it because he did authorize um, ships going down there to per, to Panama to prevent Colombia from quelling the rebellion. So that was that's pretty much 21 and uh, 22. I don't hold you have anything to add to that or. I don't know. I think you did a good job with that. I mean, if we need to include dates or anything, uh, the Hay Ponce of Fode was 1901, and the Clayton Bulwer, that was like way before um, all this other stuff happened. That was with um, Britain long before they actually went about making the canal. Another so, important person to know is William C. Gorgas, who kind of helped rid like yellow fever from the canal zone kind of similar to what Walter Reed did in uh, Cuba. All right, so for whole, I think you continue with uh, the rules about corollary, TRs, 
Okay. Version of uh, Monroe Yeah, Dock. so so we can just go right into number 23, explain the similarities and differences between the Monroe Doctrine and the Roosevelt Corollary. Um, so the okay, so if you put this in the context, hold on, let me get it. Okay, so I guess you could say the Roosevelt Corollary was a revision or more of like an addition to the Monroe Doctrine, and so the Monroe Doctrine was saying. Europe, like, stay out of the affairs in our hemisphere. And then the rules about corollary, what that did was it added, if we, if we need to, we will intervene um, for you. So what happened was that Latin American countries were not paying off their debts to Europe, or to Europe, and... So because America didn't want Europe to get involved or Britain to get involved, uh, they said, okay, we'll intervene for you. So basically this comes into like uh, what happens is that America just walks into all these places and makes sure their debts are paid off. Um, and yeah, so I mean even though they hadn't paid off their debts, these Latin American countries didn't like the fact that America was getting involved. But I guess Britain really didn't mind as long as they were being paid or getting their money back. They were okay with it. Um, so if you look at – so that was a Roosevelt corollary. If you look at the Dominican Republic, um, U.S. took over their tax collection and exercised Roosevelt's corollary. So um, they're very dominating over there. And then the bad neighbor was just the fact that Roosevelt and these people were going in and sort of taking over – and expressing their what they wanted in these other countries, they weren't like it was sort of like if you think about it, they were treating these countries as like little children and saying, "Oh, you're not sophisticated enough to handle this. I'll take care of it for you," and then intervening and then doing so. So it sort of made them feel bad about themselves and actually enraged them. And then if you look at number twenty-four, if page six hundred fifty-eight and six fifty-nine, the political cartoons. Um, there's two. There's one with called Uncle Sam Gets Cocky, which was in 1901, and there was Theodore Roosevelt and his big stick in the Caribbean uh, in 1904. If you look at the pictures, you can both realize that the first one is just saying that the Monroe Doctrine is like branching off these British countries from the rest of the people, whereas America is like this big superior bird and then the other ones are all like disorganized and all around them. Then the Theodore Roosevelt is just Theodore Roosevelt holding up his big stick, excess, expressing his power. He's like a giant, so you can see him trampling around the Caribbean Sea, um, all these Latin American countries. He's pulling around like the bo uh, the string of toys. His toys, I guess, would be the debt collector, the sheriff, the receiver, and it shows how he's expressing his power away from his, like, home territory. So, yeah. That um, takes care of that, yep. That's the uh, Roosevelt Corollary. I'm now talking about <laughs> on the world stage. So there's a war going on between Russia and Japanese called the Russo-Japanese War. And as Rahul mentioned, the Trans-Siberian Railroad earlier that Russia was building from its west part to, like, east through China... Um, and at that time, Japan owned Korea, and the railroad was bordering on their territory, and Japan didn't like that, so they bombed Port Arthur, similar to how they bombed Pearl Harbor, started a war, it was relatively one-sided, um, Japan was doing really well in the war, but they were running out of supplies, so they asked Teddy Roosevelt to mediate a peace conference between them, they did so at Portsmouth, and he signed a, and they came up with the Treaty of Portsmouth, and Japan didn't like it because they had to give back um, part of an island that they thought that they um, ended up taking from Russia in the war, and Russia didn't like it because they thought that they could win the war, which was if it kept on going on, which was very highly unlikely. But the war needed to end for Russia because they had issues on their own, and that helped Teddy Roosevelt win the Nobel Peace Prize, along with him brokering a war between Europe and 
that uh, almost caused a war between European um, powers um, and Morocco. So that was Roosevelt's big uh, claim to fame on the world mediation stage. Okay. So should I expand? Did you cover 25, Josh? Yeah. Okay. So hold on. Let me see if there's anything we need to add. I should have uh, covered everything. Did you talk about the Peace Prize, Roosevelt, that he won? Yeah. Because okay. of the, because he settled the Russo-Japanese war. Uh, yeah, and I, okay, so I mean, it was just really funny that like he won that Peace Prize even though nobody, neither side was really happy with him. <laughs> okay, so number 26. Uh, how did school board? How did a school board in California act in a way that first hurt, then helped American-Japanese relations? So, if you put this into perspective, hold on, let me get my notes out. It was like, let me give you a quick little timeline of this. Um, so, first there was a Russo-Japanese war, then came the Treaty of Portsmouth in 1905. Then what happened was, at the re because of the result of that, the animosity uh, between U.S. and Japan went up. And after that came the 1906 school board crisis, which led to the Gentlemen's Agreement, uh, which led to the Great White Fleet, or the Big Stick, and then came the Root Takahira Treaty. So if we talk about the Gentlemen's Agreement... Um okay, so how did it how did how did it hurt them? So it segregated Japanese in specific schools, and obviously Japanese people did not like this because it was segregation, that's not something they wanted. Um but then the gentleman's agreement came in, and what a gentleman's agreement is is that it relies on the honor of both parties. So it's not um, it's not like a legal written contract. So uh, this agreement sort of what happened was the segregation. What what Japan and America agreed to was that Japan would stop sending in uh, immigrants if the U.S. stopped. Um, segregating the Japanese. So as you can see, because this was a gentleman's agreement, there are a bunch of problems that can come from it. Like, um, I mean, there's no proof or no way that both sides would actually keep up their side of the treaty. And the fact that the U.S. was now saying that they had to change all their citizens' like views on the Japanese, that's not something that's very practical and not something they could do. So even though they had this agreement, it wasn't very like set in stone and it wasn't really effective. And, yeah, so we can talk about the Great White Fleet. Josh, you can take care of that. Okay. Right, the Great White Fleet, um, America just built these new steam, steam uh, steel war, warships, and um, and they basically sent, or Rosenfeld sent them on a world tour um, just to flaunt American power just to show that we can get into war if we wanted to. And we even put them into the um, American, uh, or into uh, Japan. <coughs> and instead of attacking us, Japan honored us. They started singing the Star Stinkle Banner. So it went really well with us. Um, and that's pretty much it. And then... I had another question about the open door policy about Hay Circular. Um, Hay Circular wasn't a part of it. The open door policy um, just opened up China, but the Hay Circular further um, protected Chinese independence. And I'd also like to give a shout out to Keshav Soda. Uh, All right. For tuning in. All and right. Can I, um, Finish with varying viewpoints, or oh yeah, yeah. So just uh, what do you have to do, Josh? Just finish up with the varying viewpoints. Yeah, before you get, before you get into that, 
uh, there's a request from the Dirty Scissors for me to say, Oh, kill them! I don't know if I did them the right tune, but uh, I guess that's like their motto or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, kill them! <laughs> <coughs> Alright, um, so, varying viewpoints. So, just real quick, this is not that important, but... Beal's opinions made more sense to me because basically talk about peer pressure um, from like other world powers is why we got into these world arguments. And Williams' argument made less sense because he um, said that power, because um, he basically said it was imperialism um, happened because it was necessary to expand the economy. But I don't really think that's true. So this pretty much includes this test review. Um, yeah, uh, I think before we finish, we should probably do, like, I mean, I have a couple notes on, like, timeline that we took in, that we did in class. Um, so, basically, the time period that we can look at is from the end of the Civil War to, like, like the middle, um, 19, or not the middle, like, beginning 1900s. So from 1867 to 1898, this was sort of, like, the reconstruction part after the Civil War, almost. So there was settling in the frontier, urbanization, industrialization, and at this point, ur uh, expansion was not really a part of their ideal. Uh, but right after 1898 and their war with Spain, they re realized that they needed to start picking up the pace on grabbing these... Uh, external territories. Um, and so after 1898, they started spreading out to other countries, which gave them like the Philippines, Cuba, well, not really Cuba, but uh, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, um, and Guam. Um, yeah, so... All right, I think we can... Let's just give them some time to think of any questions based on everything we've said in this broadcast. But if there are no questions, we will conclude. Some people weren't able to get on. Just throwing that out there. I don't think we... Refresh. <laughs> oh, so... <laughs> give a shout-out to my good old buddy... Sang Ho Lee um, for <laughs> tuning in <laughs> and using very creative comments for for the uh, YouTube chat. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> but as long as you're gaining something from this Sang Ho, that's terrific. Alright, so shall we finish? Uh, well, let's just give him a minute or so because I mean you can't you I sort of have to like soak in all this knowledge that we've just like thrown out at them. Oh, and a correction to the dirty scissor statement that I made before. It's not oh kill him. It's ooh kill him. Uh -huh. I don't know if I did that right. <laughs> I look forward to seeing the Dirty Scissors first rap release. Yeah. I mean, if the Dirty Scissors want to uh, feature or debut on Swag Test Prep, you can uh, <laughs> hit us up on swagtestprep at gmail.com if there's any business inquiries that you are interested in. <laughs> but, yeah, we would be open to that. Let me check Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, let's give a shout-out to Daniel Wetrick, uh, also from Randolph High School. He's probably a dirty scissor as well. He's commenting on uh, <laughs> on the YouTube, um, and yeah, <laughs> we have a bunch of viewers. Let's see. Let me check Twitter. Is he Sam and Ling? No, I think, I think, <laughs> I actually don't know. I'm pretty sure that's saying ho. <laughs> He has, like, two accounts or something. All right. So. Oh, okay. So I, I realized on Twitter that Keshav Soda is tweeting at Mr. Melvin, and he says, just had a quick question. 
is the hay circular an adjunct is the hay an adjunct to the open door policy policy or was it already encompassed in the policy Josh uh, so it, um, is it a part of it or is it like I mean I would say that hey it's circular, not a part of it the it's, open, yeah it's like a part of like that whole situation um but it was different um, it was like more an extension to the whole situation going on there. So it wasn't really a part of the open door notes, but yeah. So how how would you what would you say it was then? It was like cause I I mean, basically the open door invited people there, which created a problem that threatened uh, Chinese. Um, independence and hay circular basically prevented. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> okay, so yeah, it was saying that you have to embrace Chinese territorial integrity and also commercial integrity. Um, yeah. So, if anybody has any questions, you can ask away because we have like a couple minutes. I think we're about to end this because it's getting pretty late. Um. All right. So, uh, Sangho, to answer your question, no. <laughs> All right. So, I think that wraps up tonight's broadcast. Yeah, it looks like Josh wants to get to bed, doesn't he? Yeah. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Is this <laughs> is it past your bedtime? Yeah. All right. So, oh. thanks for tuning in, everyone. I hope you learned a lot of history. And. Um, be good. Yeah. You're taking the test tomorrow, the day after. Good luck. Yep. Feel free to rewind, click play, um, fast forward, do whatever you want after this broadcast is over. While you're at it. Yep. Subscribe, like that like button. Just just click it. You know you want to click it, right? Um, it'll help us help you. Um, and if you have any questions, like this is important. If you have any questions, like during the week, or just a question about something that's not history related. Keep in mind, swag test prep is not only history. It's test prep, meaning that it's for anything that you could ever want. You can tweet us at swag test prep. That's a new thing that we've added, um, and by doing so, we'll be able to answer all of your questions to the best of our abilities, and you know, do our best to help you do your best. Uh, that should be like her motto or something. All right, but now that nobody has any questions, thank you for watching, and let's end the broadcast. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>